the bosses and the owners here at the dance centre. Please ignore the sounds upstairs. There'll be grunts and groans and people working out and people talking on phones and things. So just trying to keep your attention uh, down on this floor. Uh, so we were talking about emptiness, this being a dance centre, and one of the things with um, dance is if you're really going to be a good dancer, <coughs> sure you have to have all the lessons and you have to learn it, but when you really truly dance, you have to let go of it all and just be in the moment. This is true of dance, it's true of many different lineages, it's true of um, Martial arts, many kinds of martial arts, true of many kinds of music. Music too, you have to learn all your scales and your notes. Um, but eventually, when you, when you really play, you just play, you have to give up everything that you know. I think it was uh, uh, Robert De Niro, one of these guys, one of these actors, who said that when you're acting, you have to learn everything there is to know about acting and then forget it all. And the reason that you forget it all is artistically, it's an artistic kind of point of creativity, you have to empty it out. If the conscious mind is starting to get involved, it's going to lessen your activity, it's going to lessen what you do. When the conscious mind is not involved, this is when you really hit the zone, when you hit the sweet spot. And this is also true of meditation, this is true of Buddhism. Um, to give you a few examples, um, they say that uh, in the psychology textbooks, me and being a psychologist, uh, they say that uh, when a tennis player sees the tennis ball hit towards them, coming at 120 miles an hour, and there isn't any way that they can see and register the ball or where it's going, and then make the appropriate reactions. They're, they have to actually act and start preparing themselves to return the serve before they can even see the ball coming. Now actually you see the ball, but it goes into the unconscious mind first. The conscious mind is quite a lot slower. The conscious mind is where the self arises, where your thoughts, views and opinions and your history and your worries and your anticipations and expectations come into play. But this is where as human beings you spend most of your life, with this self, with all this baggage and all this, these things that you carry around with you. Sooner or later with meditation, we have to get back to this point of immediacy, the point where everything is let go of, the point of emptiness. To give another example, um, uh, runners will actually, I don't know how they figure this out, it's just in the books, but uh, runners, when they're waiting to start a race, their body will actually leap up and start running before the conscious mind hears the starting gun. This shows that you, you train yourself, but having trained yourself, you have to let go of everything that you've trained and come to this point of emptiness. Uh, the same is true in many sports, and me being English, I'm not very keen on sports. It's too cold. Right? Who wants to go and play football in England? When I was a kid, they had, uh, like, you know, the men, the guys, you know, the, the hairy kids, they always used to play football in the evening and churn the pitch up. And then all of us kind of skinny kids who couldn't do proper sports, we had to play in the morning when the pitch was frozen solid. And having been churned up the night before, and the next morning, solid and frozen, it's like jammy rocks. And uh, so I'm not a big sports fan. Uh, sports is torture for us. <laughs> Uh, but I do like boxing, and one of the things they do in boxing is basically um, it's basically eight ways that you can swing at another person, and twelve ways that you can defend against them. And what boxers do is what they call reps or repetitions, and they will repeat these same moves over and over and over again until eventually the moves are so ingrained in their body that when they're in an actual fight. Their body will move long before the conscious mind has had a chance to register what the opponent is doing. Now I thought this was a nice uh, kind of theme to have for the uh, Dhamma talk series, because Dhamma or Buddhism 
uh, and many other lineages uh, of meditation are actually very much similar. We have thousands and thousands of teachings. Thousands of teachings. 84,000 teachings apparently in Buddhism, but I'm not sure anybody's counted them. I'm sure if they did, they would find a lot more. Um, and all the other religions and spiritual traditions and yoga traditions, etc. There's a lot of these teachings out there. And yet all of these teachings are all leading back to this same one point, this point of emptiness, this point of giving up, letting go, stopping still. This point of immediacy uh, or pure, unadulterated awareness. This is, the, this is the point that we're trying to get back to. So there's a bit of a juxtaposition between the, the you could say, the, the esoteric teachings and the exoteric teachings. The exoteric teachings being the, the teachings that are put out there, all these suttas and all these teachers and, uh, and all these books, especially these days, every Tom, Dick and Harry is writing a book these days. And the esoteric teachings being the, or the mystic teachings being the path where the people who practice it are not usually great scholars, but they're the people who go off to the mountains or the caves uh, or under the trees and actually sit and start doing the meditation. When you sit and start to do the meditation, all these teachings that you've learned, you have to give them up. And as you give them up, you come back to this point of very immediate, very bright, very vibrant awareness. You're in the zone, in the meditation zone. So I wanted to do a quick uh, exercise, a quick practice. And we're going to do just five minutes of meditation. Uh, so you can settle yourself comfortably. Try to sit, uh, try to sit straight. And what we're going to do is practice awareness, awareness meditation. Now awareness is aware of whatever is happening. Anything that's happening, we've got a good, good test for you. <laughs> Uh, anything that's happening around you, the people coughing or sneezing or your, your, your nose is itching, um, there's sounds going on, there are thoughts going on, anything that's going on, it doesn't matter what you do, so you make a note of it and you come back to the sense of presence, the sense of breathing, the sense of awareness. So just for a few minutes we're going to do that and see what happens. Okay. So gently close your eyes. Time you feel your mind is distracted, you can bring it back. So gently open your eyes, adjust your posture. Now, did anybody get enlightened? <laughs> you might note that when you stop and you take a look and you feel on a feeling level, you might know that there's a sense of not quite rightness. There's a sense that you still have something to attain to, you still have something to do. You're not just sitting there perfectly happy and perfectly blissful. Even if you're able to put your mind onto something beautiful like loving kindness or uh, some kind of meditation technique that you practice, you can only keep that going for a little while before you come back to this sense of presence again, and this sense of not quite rightness. This is dukkha, this is the slight dis-ease that lies behind all of our um, feeling, that lies behind life. In Buddhism when they say life is suffering or there is suffering, what they're really talking about is just this, just this feeling that of not quite rightness. When we say about, talk about suffering, that doesn't mean that life's terrible and really sucks and, you know, maybe in England it does, but in Thailand you've got, you've got all these beautiful fruits and food and nice people and people smiling at you. Uh, life's a nice thing, it's a good thing. But there is always this sense of disquiet behind your experience. And it was this particular feeling that Buddha himself was interested in. And when he went out to, to practice meditation, all the different kinds of meditation 
methods that he used, it was this that he was interested in. Is there something else? Is there some other way to put the mind? Is there some other way to be? Then when he became enlightened, um, he said repeatedly, uh, this Dhamma that I have attained to, it cannot be realized by somebody who is caught in passion and aversion. It's difficult to see, it can be known only by the wise. It's subtle, it's abstruse. I need to look that word up, abstruse. Um, <laughs> It means it's hard to see. Uh, it's abstruse. Um, it goes against the world of stream, namely the stilling of all mind states, the relinquishing of attachment to cessation and nibbana. So he's talking about something that's rather subtle, but I was very interested in this idea that it goes against the world of stream. And the world of stream means, as normal people, what you're interested in is getting more stuff, having more stuff, right? Uh, me plus something is always better than me myself. In the Buddhist terms, uh, it was described as the Arya path and the Anarya path, which we translate as the noble and the um, ignoble, is that a word? Um, the worldly, the worldly path and the spiritual path, or the noble path and the worldly path. The worldly path, according to these suttas, it's quite amusing. He goes in search of wife, children, goats, sheep, fowl, pigs, elephants, cattle, horses, mares, gold and silver. I think we need to update the list a bit now. Um, going in search of iPhones and iPads and cars and Mercedes Benz. And if you want the full list, you can go into any of the malls in Bangkok and you get a full list of the things that people are seeking for. And the Arya path, on the other hand, is the opposite. It's going in the opposite direction. It lies in relinquishing, it lies in giving up. So this is a totally different direction uh, in which you're taking, in which you're practicing, in which you're trying to develop. In this line of practicing, you're emptying out. You're not trying to add in more views and opinions and more ideas and more things. You're trying to get to this point of immediacy, this point of vibrant awareness, and uh, point of, I would argue, a point of creativity uh, that lies there when you've emptied everything else out. This is what is left remaining when everything else is given up. This is the thing that we're trying to get to with the level path. Now, what we have to do then is choose, and most people choose comfort, we choose, it's nicer to get a few more things and have a few more things, right? One survey was done, uh, it found out, it was measuring how much income a person needs to be happy. And the level of income that practically everybody across the board, above the breadline of course, the amount of income you needed to be happy was roughly one third more than you actually have already. And it didn't matter if you were very poor or you were very rich, you were always Basically, everybody thought that just one third more we were able to make them happy. So we have this feeling that if we can just add a little bit more to ourselves, then we get to the happiness. And yet the meditation is taking in the opposite direction, saying if you can relinquish, if you can give up a little bit more, then you find something that is really happy, that is really beautiful, that is really pure. This point of vibrancy, this point of awareness. Now, most people, of course, don't choose the meditation path, the esoteric path of mysticism. Um, there's one story of Milarepa, he was a great sage, and he went up to the mountain and asked his guru, what is the secret of enlightenment? And his guru said, the secret of enlightenment is sitting hours upon hours upon hours of ardent meditation till your flesh withers away, you've got calluses on your legs and on your backside. Day after day, year after year, this is the secret of meditation. And Milarepa said, hmm, is there anybody else up here I can talk to? <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't choose it, right? And what we do in the face of uh, confusion, in the face of life, what you do is you choose a nice comfort <coughs> zone, a comfort zone of, of your explanations of the universe, of the world, of life and death. You make up a set of explanations that works for you, that you feel comfortable with. 
Uh, and this was actually discovered by a chap called George Kelly, who's a very great psychologist, a very underrated psychologist. Uh, he invented, or, or he described, personal construct theory. And he was treating people in depression era, era America, in Kansas, I think it was Kansas. And these people were poor, and the, the economy was collapsing, and they didn't know about boom and bust cycles at the time. They, they actually thought the world was ending. They thought everything was falling apart. The banks were falling apart, businesses were falling apart. And these people then, the very poor people, would go to him for psychotherapy, and he would do dream analysis on them. And after a while, he started to like wonder, this, this doing Freudian dream analysis on these kind of people is obvious what, what their problems are. But the weird thing was, it worked. And in many of the cases, you do this dream analysis on people, and it worked. They would actually go away and they'd feel better. Uh, and this is when he came up with the idea that actually it's not the psychotherapy that works. What you're really doing is just giving people a way to think about the world. A nice, comfortable set of constructs, he called them constructs. Uh, these are your expectations, your beliefs, uh, your filters through which you view the world. So most of us get a set of constructs uh, that works for us. Right? And, you know, life and death, and what is consciousness and memory, and what am I here for? We have a nice, comfortable set of constructs that explains these things away. Uh, even in religion, it's the same. All these 84,000 teachings that people like to study and learn and recite. And these, again, ultimately, they become a comfortable set of ideas that you can carry around with you in order to understand your experience. This is one reason why, after a tsunami or a natural disaster, people start to turn to religion rather than away. Uh, really, you think, like, well, why did God do this? Uh, you think people will be less likely to turn to religion in these circumstances. But in the face of disaster, in the face of discomfort, in the face of your own mortality, you're looking for an explanation. And most people are very happy with it. You would think, like, for me as a monk, a lot of my life would be teaching stuff, right, as a Buddhist expert, supposedly. Uh, one of the funny experiences of being a monk is you spend most of your life being preached to. Every time I go in the taxi, the taxi drivers, right, when did you ordain? And before I, I finish, they start telling me all their philosophical views, all their religious views. Uh, I go out to people and I meet people uh, socially, and usually they're forced, as soon as they see me, they want to give me all their views about religion and the world. And <laughs> I actually thought, I thought that I would be the one telling other people. This is why I do these dinosaurs, you see, I've got you in a silent moment. <laughs> I've got you nailed down on the seat, so now it's my one chance of the year I can get my own views out. Usually what happens then is I'm like, oh, I'm not even sure what I think now. <laughs> uh, so, the, uh, this point of, uh, this is what, um, this set of ideas that you create about the religion, that you create about the teachings, uh, one very clever man called um, Archie Cochran, I think his name was, uh, Archie Cochran. He was a doctor in World War II and he was, in, he was a prisoner in the German concentration camp. And he came up with what he called the God, com God Complex. And this is thinking that you know it all, thinking that you have the explanation. What he did was he found at the time that they, the prisoners were suffering from this disease where the water was filled with skin. The, sorry, skin was filled with water. And, um, uh, and it's very painful and ultimately could cause death. And so what this, what Archie did was he just tried stuff. Now normally as a doctor you have this God complex. You know what a disease is, you know what the treatment is, and won't be told won't be tired anybody who argues with you. I don't know if you've been to doctors in Thailand, but um, they never give you explanations from anything. Uh, doctors in England, they used to like explain to you a little bit and stuff, but in Thailand they never explain anything. You take these pills and please don't look it up on the internet. Uh, <laughs> which can be quite lethal, I've made that mistake myself. 
Uh, and so he was a doctor, and he, he saw this, you know, the doctors, he saw that people would have this set of beliefs that they hang on to as being true and real. And in many circumstances, it didn't work. Now, actually, it was quite different. He used to just try stuff, see what happened. So, like any Englishman, even if you're in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II, he still managed to get himself a supply of marmite. Um, <laughs> for the British, not the Americans. Uh, if you don't know what marmite is, it's it kind of it's a bit like road tar, and it tastes like like concentrated salt. And we British we love it. And no Nazi concentration camp is going to keep us between our marmite. Uh, stand between us and our marmite. And he found the people he gave marmite to, he'd give marmite to some of the people and not to others. And then he found that the people who had marmite got better, and the people who didn't have marmite got worse. Uh, we now know the explanation for it is because of the vitamin B12 in the marmite, they have a vitamin deficiency. So he was quite clever, he, he used to just try stuff, and then he'd blame the doctors and say, you have this God complex that you think you know stuff. And really, you don't. Uh, another one of his experiments, he treated heart patients. I'm not quite sure what, um, uh, what the, the condition was, but he did experiment with heart patients. Some of them he would leave in the hospital to be treated. After the treatment, they would be looked after in hospital. And the others he would send home. And the doctors were furious, because how can you send sick people home? And after doing these experiments, he said, okay, there's a small sample group that we have, but what we found is, uh, here's the graph, and the people who have, who have stayed in the hospital, like 80% get better, and the people who stay at home, 30% get better. And the doctors banged their fists on the table and shouted at him, see, you've been harming people by your foolish experimentations. We told you that people should stay in the hospital. And then he said, actually, I've reversed the figures. And most of the, pe the people who got better were the people who went home, not the ones who stayed in the hospital. Apparently, it's been a silence, like tumbleweed across the, uh, across the room. Uh, my favorite example, uh, one lady, the Crimean War, before actually Falkland's time, Crimean War, when the British and French went to give Russia a bloody nose, we knew we had no chance fighting against the Russians, but so we picked this nondescript little peninsula in, in the Black Sea called the Crimea and decided we'd go there, we'd give everyone a thumping, and before the Russians turned up, we'd leave. And then we had our kind of dignity. Um, and it was a total disaster. 90% of the people, British and French, who went died of disease, they didn't die from fighting. Same was true for the Russians. 90% of the Russians died on the walk to the Crimea. They made an army of a million people, and most of 900,000 of them died on the way there. Um, and so the British sent this one rather feisty old lady, she wasn't a very nice person, um, with a crew of other ladies to go and, uh, and, go and look after the soldiers there. And what they found was the officers would go and who had money would go and have treatment. And the people who didn't have money, they would go to these ladies, and the ladies would just kind of do their best looking after them. And after a while, what they found was the people who went to be looked after by the ladies were far more likely to recover than the people who were treated by the doctors. In those days, the doctors used to, they had this theory that the body would build up pressure in different areas. And that was the cause of disease. This is only like 150 years ago, we're still doing this. And so to cure somebody, what they do is they cut the veins and let the blood out. And when you let the blood out, you release the pressure in that area of the body and, and hopefully fix you up. And this had been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years without realizing that he was killing people. Uh, what the ladies did was basically they looked after, they kept everything clean. Hygiene, clean air, light, warmth, and rest. Basically, that's what they gave people. And that was what the soldiers needed to in order to recover. You know who I'm talking about, the lady? Florence Nightingale? <laughs> she wasn't a very nice person, by all accounts. Um, 
had one, possibly she had one discussion about Robert Peel, the Prime Minister of Britain, and with somebody who was supporting Peel, and everything that they said good about Peel, she'd come up with something nasty. And in exasperation, then, uh, the person that she was talking to said, well, at least the man's got a lovely smile, you can't deny that. And Florence Nightingale replied, yes, like the silver plate on a coffin. <laughs> she, she wasn't somebody you'd want to spend time with, but she was looking at what actually worked. And she invented <coughs> one nursing, she invented one hospitals. Her handbook that she wrote for the guidebook for, for nursing and hospitals is still used today. So this is the, the God complex, and what it means is you have this set of working ideas uh, that gets you through. And we all carry around our own little God complex, this set of constructs that we have that, uh, that works for us. This gets us by um, in the world. And yet, we're still in suffering. Still, yet, when we stop and we take a look, we find this sense of dis-ease. When you stop and close your eyes, there's something still not quite right. With these teachings on emptiness, then, what we're trying to do is to empty out all of these concepts. All of these views and opinions that you have, you're going to have to empty them out and give them up in order to get back to this point of vibrancy, this point of wakefulness, this point of awareness, which is what meditation is all about. So it's kind of ironic, we have all these beautiful teachings of Buddhism, but all of them are pointing to get you back to this thing. Most people trade, we'd rather have ideas about something than the real thing. We'd rather read about meditation in the book, then actually really do the work, sit on the cushions and try to experience it. It's tricky, it's difficult, the mind is very slippery, it gets away from you and it takes some time and it takes some dedication in order to develop this kind of meditation practice. Uh, we'd much prefer to just think about it. In fact, when you gain knowledge, as uh, Gant Chapel, Irving Breederman, I think his name was, uh, and he would do this, he's a neurophysicist, neuroscientist, and he would watch people's brains when he gives them a problem and when they find the solution to the problem. And when somebody's working out a problem, the brain gives out stress hormones. And when they find the solution to the problem, the brain gives out basically opium kind of neurotransmitters. You get this rush of satisfaction that you've learned something new, you've solved a new problem. Same is true actually with sex. It gives out this, with arousal, you get a set of um, uh, stress hormones that then gets gets released. It's the same with food. Actually, food when you're feeling hungry it starts to fire out all these stress hormones, uh, and then when you start to eat, the hormones change and we signal your body like ah. So you get this feeling. You always get this feeling that you've attained to a slight sense of satisfaction. Uh, in actual fact, it's temporary, um, and um, the same just for an idea. We get this just for ideas, so we have to figure stuff out, and figure out teachings and meditation and enlightenment. Uh, that isn't it either. So all of these teachings are pointing towards taking you back to this point of awareness. This is the key. Uh, this point of awareness, and. So if somebody, if you were in a prison and somebody was to slip the key under the door and you were hang, to hang the key on the wall and worship the key, oh glorious key, you are the source of my freedom, and bow to it and make religious sacrifices to it. It's nuts, right? Sooner or later you have to pick up that key and use it to open the door. So this is what we're doing when we're acting now. This is why all these teachings are pointing to a point of emptiness. And this is going, remember the quote that I gave you earlier about the worldly stream? This is going against the worldly stream. The worldly stream is always has this basic formula that me plus something has got to be better than me. Me plus a Porsche is got to be better than just me. Or a Lamborghini. Right? You know Jerry Seinfeld and his Porsche obsession? I think 96 Porsches he had by the end of it. Um, gets one and he feels nice, so he gets another one and another one. And eventually he was building this huge underground cavern to, uh, in his house to store all these Porsches. 
Uh, by that time, he had like a few others, you know, a few Ferraris and things. Uh, and he actually exceeded the size that he had permission for, and the planning council made him fill in this great big hole that he'd done. Uh, and I think that's when he started to realize that, hey, I can only drive one car at a time. So, <laughs> um, me plus something has got to be better than me. Here we're doing the opposite, we're going against the stream, we're emptying it out. My favorite example, actually, Nobody told me my microwave fell off. My favourite example actually is soap. Um, you just can't get soap anymore, can you? It always has to be soap plus something, right? And I get whatever soap people give me. And right now I'm on this soap plus strawberry extract. <laughs> and on the bottle, uh, I'm not joking, on the bottle it says, for strawberry kissable skin. Exactly <laughs> what? <laughs> Just what I needed. <laughs> Actually, I have a big soap dispenser, and what I do is any, so any of these liquid soaps that I get given, I pour it all in this dispenser, and I mix them up. And it's all soap, right? Uh, the last one I got given was, um, do you know quickly heat powder? This is like talcum powder that you put on, and it kind of burns, but makes you feel cold. Well, they, may, they now have a quickly heat soap as well. All goes in the same pot. So I have strawberry kissable skin, but if you kiss me, you'll burn your lips. <laughs> if I wasn't a monk, I think what I would do actually, I'd like to open up a business uh, and make products that are what they say they are. Soap. Nothing else. A bar of soap. That's it. Shampoo, 200 milliliters. That's it. Uh, no additives, no extras, nothing on the packet. And people like me, would really like that. <laughs> this simply buys our decision. I know you guys are all too sophisticated, but I'm going to market my product in Australia where I think it will work. <laughs> uh, so, these teachings are coming to emptying out, of giving up, of relinquishing, going against the world stream. Now, I want to give you a very short one of the teachings of Buddhism, which is a good example. It's very uh, uh, it's quite an involved teaching actually, but I'm just going to give you the very rough basics of it. And this is called Greed, Hatred and Delusion. And this is, if ever you do any study in Buddhism, sooner or later you come across Greed, Hatred and Delusion. And these are called the roots of evil in Buddhism, or the roots, the roots of unwholesome behavior. And I asked my teacher, I said, why only three? Uh, and he said, well, you know, the Buddha, he didn't plan it out, and somebody asked him, and he just whistled it up, over the top of his head. And I was never quite satisfied with that. Greed, hatred, and delusion. Greed, meaning that you want to get stuff, you want to get your extra Porsche and Lamborghini, you want to get something extra. Everyone knows that greed's no good, but greed is in wanting. It's like, surely you want to pass exams, or get a good job, or look after your family. You know, what, what exactly is wrong with desire? Then, uh, that's Lopa, uh, Dosa is the next one, Tor in Thai, um, which means hating or disliking or aversion. Uh, and again, there's a good side to this, right? I mean, if you didn't have some kind of aversion, you wouldn't solve problems, right? Tax in when he, he first came to Bangkok, I'm going to solve the Bangkok traffic problem in six months. <laughs> uh, who is it? Chu Wit is the new guy. Um, He's a politician, and you don't see his signs with him like this. Uh, and his signs say, Ge kai kan ha, which means, I will solve problems. Uh, and he markets himself in this way. You need a bit of dosa, you need a bit of aversion, right, to, to solve problems. To not put up with corruption or people pushing in front of you in a queue and you know, things like that. So I wondered why was dosa this aversion? Why is this also a root of unwholesome behavior? And then the last one is really confusing. It's moha, delusion. And I never found anybody who can tell me what that is, but I'm sure we all have it. Um, delusion, not knowing what's what. First one, uh, uh, greed uh, or desire, making stuff happen. The second one is dosa or aversion. Stuff happens to you, and the third one is 
uh, delusion where you don't know what the hell happens. But <laughs> you know what the hell just happened. So I wanted to figure out why was there only three of these? Um, you know, what does the teaching mean? And then I found it in the subtext. It actually says the people who are based, greed-based characters are people who like to focus on what they like. People who are dosa or hate-based characters focus on what they dislike. And the moha-based people focus on stuff that they either like or dislike. The best example actually for moha is uh, it's a pastime, it's a stimulation an engagement that you're engaging the mind in the past time, but without any real feeling behind it. Kind of like chit-chatting, conversation, reading newspapers, uh, watching TV is the best example, getting on the internet and you get lost for hours. And, I mean, it's called more, more like delusion, it's just a pastime. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with those things, I mean, you can watch TV once in a while. Do you know watching TV, they did this experiment, some psychologists, put some people in a room and told them to do nothing. Can't speak, talk or do anything. And a bunch of other people in the room to watch TV. And the people who are watching TV actually burnt fewer calories than the people who did nothing at all. TV is pure delusion. Another one they did, they asked, had students, what, they paid students to watch TV all day. Where was I? Where were these people when I was in school? Um, I had them watch TV all day, and periodically they went and asked them, what, what were you watching three hours ago? And basically nobody would say, this is delusion. Uh, so this was people who like to focus on the things that you like, people who focus on the things that you dislike, and the people who focus on things that is neither liking nor disliking. And this is everything, right? That's everything, that's the everything, tell me what. Every activity that you can do, basically, you can fall into these three. So if every activity that you can do falls into these three, and all the root of unwholesome behavior, what is left over? This is how this teaching is a good example of coming back to this point of emptiness. If you pick up and you consider this teaching, it's not really about the teaching, whether there's three or six or there's five or this, or how clever the teaching is. It's supposed to take you to the point where you stop there's nothing left. Right? That is all activities that you can basically do. They're going to be based upon liking, disliking, or neutral. So what's left over is emptiness. What's left over is this point of awareness, just this point of vibrancy, this point of uh, wakefulness. And this is what we're always heading back to in meditation. So in Theravada Buddhism, uh, we don't talk very much about emptiness, but I remind you, all of our teachings are trying to take you back to this point where you're emptying out, you're giving up your views and opinions, you're giving up this natural tendency to accumulate, to get more things, to have more, and you're taking your mind back to wakefulness, awareness. As with all things, as you go inwardly, it always works in a paradox, so the more you give away, the more you have, the more you give up, uh, the more you feel you have gained. Um, always when you're turning your attention inwards, things go in a, in a paradox. So the more that you empty out, the more fulfilled you, you feel. And this is why people do meditation. After you get good at it, after you've done it for a while, you start to get this sense of fulfillment. But really, to feel happy or joy lies more in the stationary mind, in the still mind, in the mind that's bright and alert rather in the mind that is always looking for stimulation uh, in the environment around you. So, over the next few weeks I'm going to be talking about some of the main Buddhist concepts, but always in relation to how they take you back to this point of uh, emptiness. I'm going to leave you with a Zen koan. Uh, in Zen Buddhism they ask you, they have these koans where they ask you questions, that can't really be answered. But I think now, if you've all been paying attention, we should be able to, we should know that answer. This is a very famous koan. If a man is sitting on the top of a hundred foot pole, how does he proceed? Okay. I'm not seeing very many nods of understanding. <laughs> He can't go forward, he can't go backward, he can't go up, he can't go down. What does he do? Huh? 
zitter, <laughs> balance, equipoise, awareness. So again, all of these teachings are always trying to take you back to this point of equipoise, this point of balance, this point of awareness. So, I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully given some uh, insight into, uh, although we'll go through some of the different Buddhist teachings over the few, uh, next few weeks, this should be maybe clear at least that these teachings and other teachings, it wasn't only Buddhism that discovered this path, it exists in uh, many, many cultures. Uh, the, hero's, uh, the hero's journey, uh, which we'll be talking about a lot more on week number five. Um, it exists in many cultures, uh, always trying to take you back to this point. The hero is always somebody who is a little bit ignorant, a little bit uh, dumb, but kind of innocent and bright. Luke Skywalker's, and the King Arthur's, and Samson, Samson Delilah, uh, etc. So we're going to keep coming back to the teachings, but in the sense of how you can use them as a key. The teachings themselves are not uh, real, they're not supposed to be worshipped, they're not supposed to be hung on the wall, uh, they're not supposed to be made into statues and bound to. They're supposed to take you back to this point of meditation. So we're just going to do a little bit of meditation together, and then if you have any questions, uh, I would love to try and find an answer. But if you don't have any questions, I'll ask you the questions. So, so if you sit, make yourself comfortable. <laughs>